Good afternoon, students. I am Professor Slabbert, and yes, um, it is now five o'clock, so the meeting started. And the purpose of the meeting is, is uh, basically so that you could ask questions. So is there anyone that wants to go first? You can ask me any question on, on the work that you have done. And then we can discuss it because by now I think that you know more or less as much as I do. So you are welcome. Anyone who wants to start? Yes, Jock. Uh, evening, Prof. Um, I was just wondering, um, on the assignments, not really got to do with the work itself, but more the assignments. Um, on the, my numbering was crossed out. Uh, do you perhaps know as to why it, it was crossed out? Uh, so it's basically just a diagonal line right through 4.1, 4.2, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Bonnie didn't indicate why? And uh, no, no. Um, OK, let me just make a note. I'll speak to her because usually she should indicate. OK, Jock, do you have a student number, Jock? Uh, I've got a UNISA student number. I don't know if if that would help. Um, no, just give me what your surname. Uh, it's uh, Budrick, so it's B-U-D. Yes. R I. Yes. CKS. OK, I'll just ask her because yes, um, unless it's completely wrong. <laughs> but but I'll ask her to have a look. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. OK, anyone else with a burning question? OK, then in order to get yourselves relaxed, and maybe questions will pop up. I'm going to discuss a new case with you. I'm going to share to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Let's see, share screen. Hi, Prof. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, Prof, uh, with regards to the uh, the assessments, right? Uh, yes. Apart from the two portfolios and uh, the compulsory test one. Yes, yes. Um, there's quite a few other um, uh, online tests, like the introduction, medical law and the constitution, medical negligence. So under every yes. single, you know, uh, uh, um, work that content that we covered, Prof, um yes. are those are those uh, um uh tests compulsory because it only says test one is compulsory yeah no it's not compulsory it is for for self testing so that you can just test yourself or see what we could possibly ask but no it is not compulsory the only compulsory is test one that will count 80 percent to your final mark and then portfolio one and portfolio two and they will contribute 80 percent of your final mark and may i just add while we speak about the work if you pass this module especially if you pass it very good be absolutely proud of yourselves because it's a lot of information in a very short time so i i think the standard is is quite high so i think you can be proud of yourselves if if you if you pass it and especially if you if you pass it well Thanks so much for that, Prof. Anyone else with a question? OK, uh, so yes. sorry, I'm, yes, <laughs> I apologize. Yes, you're welcome. No, you're welcome. Yes, your PowerPoint slides. Can you make that available to us, please, man? The, the PowerPoints that is on the recordings on the site. Correct, yeah. um, 
Yes, I can. Um, um, uh, let me just make a note. I can I send it to it, Grace yes. or Bonnie, and and she can share it. The PowerPoints. Thanks. But just you know, I prop. It's it's easier to to uh, navigate through the PowerPoint slides, you know, and and compile the you know our, our summaries and notes. Okay, no problem. No problem. It's on my computer, so I will send it after the meeting tonight and they will probably upload it tomorrow. It's no problem. It, Prof. Thank you so much. Okay, Andrew, I, I see you've got your hand on. Yes, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, I just wondered if um, I'm curious, um, in your experience, uh, what percentage of sort of medico legal uh, claims are, are settled versus those that actually go the full litigation route? Okay, um, the majority are settled, which is not um, um, cerebral palsy, and especially in the in the private sector. In the private sector, the, the, the private hospitals, they do not like to be in the media or, um, yes, so that they, their name gets exposed, etc. So the, the private hospitals, this is a huge frustration. And <laughs> might I add, I think it's a, it's a little bit unethical because a lot of um, um, cases in the private sector, it drags on. For example, I'm involved in, in, a, in a case against MediClinic. It's been dragging on since 2018. And we are already in 2023, so it's it's nearly five years. And they're dragging and dragging and dragging. And I am sure, as I, I sit here, that they're going to settle on the steps of the court. But I, I don't know why. I don't know why attorneys do it. Maybe it's it's for the money or maybe they instructed to, to do it. I find it especially with the bigger law firms that um, they drag it out and then they settle on the day of, of the court case. It's, it's unfortunate. But yes, to answer your question very shortly, especially in the private sector, um, what they are doing or trying to do now in the public sector is to, to mediate because the court rules makes provision for mediation, but that is, for example, for smaller cases. Um, maybe maybe you are diabetic and you um, had a problem with your foot and the foot is amputated, but you did not give informed consent, etc. in the public sector. Those cases are, are easier to mediate because, yes, damage were done and an amount needs to be paid out. I find with cerebral palsy cases, and that is also my advice, is um, specifically in cerebral palsy cases, these are too difficult to mediate and um, because the claims are in the vicinity of 25 to 35 million. And and those cases, it is, it is better to go to court because you've got experts, and and you need to um, to prove the the case, but yes, if I've answered your question in the private sector, a lot of them are settled out of court. Yes, no, thank you. Because uh, yeah, the, the second part of that question was, what is the the average length of time that these cases go? I see from a lot of the case studies we've looked at, these as you've said, tend to span multiple years in some cases. Is, is that normal or do you find the simpler cases can be wrapped up within a few months? It all depends. It, it, it all depends. Remember, he who alleges must prove. So it is the person instituting the action, whether they at the end of the day are willing to go for mediation or willing to accept um, um, uh, a settlement. It, it, it depends on so many things. But yes, if you go to, I think in the first lecture, I referred to that document of the Law Reform Commission. That, there's a document on uh, medical legal issues. And if, if you just go through those, you will see that some cases goes 16 years, 10 years, five years. So it, it, it all depends on whether the 
the, the people wants an answer or no. But yes, cerebral palsy cases, no, that, that won't go fast, especially because so many experts are involved. And those can drag on for many, many, many years. And then the poor child is already seven, maybe 11, um, when at least they're, they're, they're there's an outcome. So yes, it, it is difficult, but if you go to that document, you'll, you'll get a good idea of, of the time spent on these cases. Yeah, because I see from the one case study, it, it, it seemed as though it was a tactic whereby uh, the, the child actually passed away during proceedings. And because of that, a large portion of the claims fell away, obviously for future costs. So is that not really a lot of the time the tactic behind the delaying strategy? I don't know, and I wish I knew, but that that depends on the attorneys. The question now is the ethical question. If the child passes away, let's say the child passes away a week before judgment will be given or quantum will be settled, you get some attorneys firms who do not tell that the, the the child has passed away. Of course, if the child passed away and and everyone is aware of that, yes, the future medical costs falls away. This it is also interesting. I got a question the other day. The the child is already nineteen. The child is already 19. Now, remember, prescription runs three years. So the past medical costs would have prescribed, depending on whether the, the, the uh, parents were of an intellect to understand they had a um, they had a claim. Um, if you go to the judgment of the Constitutional Court, yes, prescription is three years, but it depends on so many factors. So if you can prove that the mother, for example, did not know at all that she had a claim, then they can even award past medical costs. The child, of course, um, the, the, it only prescribes three years after reaching the age of majority of becoming 18. So the child is now, now nine so they are within that limit. Also, depending on whether the child can understand um, what is going on and, and the claim, etc. Otherwise, it never prescribes. I, I personally think it is opportunistic from the side of the attorneys to, to uh, take a case on like that, because where will you get the evidence? 19 years after the birth happened. It, it, it is so extremely difficult. And once again, as I've said, he who alleges must prove. So the proof is on, on the plaintiff, on, on the mother and the child who's claiming the money. But how on earth they are going to prove it, I don't know. So I, I find that there's a lot of opportunistic attorneys nowadays that think they can make a lot of money on contingency. Out of these cases, but it's it's not that easy to to prove the case. Okay, um, Mr. Kola, Sinkandar Kola, if I'm pronouncing that correct, yes. Sinkandar, thank you, Prof. Um, just to yes. follow up on Andrew's question, do you believe that there is a reluctance in the public sector to use alternative dispute resolution? I mean, they 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 they. Their files must be, I mean, you know, going through the roof um, with, with the number mm. of claims against, you know, against them in the public sector. Um, no, I don't think there's really a reluctance. I think it's a, a shortage of manpower. But remember, the state attorney doesn't handle all the cases. The state attorney contracts certain um, legal firms to to handle on their behalf. I I think they are behind, and I think it's just a matter of um, the attorney's firm with whom they have contracted not buying into it or not promoting it. 
Um, but once again, there's costs involved. So if you settle it much quicker through mediation, then of course the attorney cannot inv invoice such a big amount. So it, it depends. It depends. There are attorneys' firms who are extremely positive and, and they try to do it. The problem that they sometimes face is, is to get hold of accredited mediators. Um, remember, there's a little bit of logistics around it. You must get an accredited mediator. Sometimes um, that person will have a legal background, but you will also need to have an expert in the field that the problem arose, um, a, a medical expert. Um, some of them, the, the costs are also very high. Then you need a venue. You will pay. You have to organize a venue and pay the venue cost and then try to determine the amount of days um, that it can take. I think it should happen more often, and I think it should be promoted. I just don't think it is so common at this moment, but, but it will be depending on the attorney's firms that the, um, the state attorney contracts with, whether they will drive it or not. Uh, okay. It's just that, you know, the, the, the rules of court provide, uh, I mean, even in the high court now with the rule 41 capital A provides for alternative dispute resolution. And it's actually quite um, disturbing to see that um, in most cases in the public sector, you know, it is the indigent that, um, you know, uh, that are usually prejudiced um, <clears throat> to, 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 you know, to huge extent. I mean, hey, should they should you know should they engage litigation? The problem is, where do they find the money to continue with that litigation? And you know, I mean, if 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 one re, you know tries to educate them and say, listen, it's the amount of money it's going to cost you to litigate this is is uh, uh, probably the amount that you're going to get compensated at the end of the day. Or alternatively, yes. you're still going to need money to pay off that second bond that you took to, you know, to, yes. to pay for your litigation costs. So you're not going to come out with anything. Rather sit down, you know, there's uh, maybe they, they, they've got certain um, mm. uh, 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 bands of like if you lose a finger, you're going to get 100,000 rands. That's the maximum <laughs> yes. that the, yes. the state is going to pay. Rather settle yes. now. So I think it's it's also a, a lot of about edu educating your your mm. you know your client. Um, am I <laughs> you agreeing with me? At uh, you know I, I, yes. I just um, I, I just absolutely agree with you. you. And yes, and, and remember, I'm an academic, so I'm not in practice. What is the courts doing if, if they ask the parties whether they have um, tried alternative dispute resolutions and the parties say no? What power does the court have to, to sort of insist that they should first try that. I, I don't know. How is the rule happening in practice? Um, does the judge know about it, ask about it, or, or what? Um, in, do you have experience about uh, No, uh, Prof, in terms of the, the, high court, uh, the high court rules, Rule 41A, um, it would be frowned upon if you hadn't entered into uh, alternative dispute resolution. So you got to give the court some kind of report that you've engaged okay. ADR, but you did it didn't work out, and then you can you know continue to litigate. In the lower yes. courts, what's even more disappointing and disheartening, they were running a trial program. Okay, um, it I mean this has been coming on since 1997 or or, or some sort. And then they terminated this trial program uh, indefinitely last year on the 15th of March in the lower courts. So, you know, uh, we, we hmm. take two steps back and we take 25, uh, 25, sorry, two steps forward and 25 steps back. So, you know, with all the, you know, all the work that has been put into um, putting in place ADR, um, there's just no drive from the DOJ and I, yes. that, that's just a personal opinion. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Let the other colleagues continue with their questions. Thanks, yes. Prof. Okay, but I agree with you. Let's get Anari Anari Throbler. Prof, I just want to know 
How can you prove your case and appoint medical experts if the hospital conveniently lost or lost or misplaced the medical records or the maternity register? How can you proceed with your case? Excuse Anari, um, I'm I'm old, so you're a bit fluffy, so I couldn't hear. Just repeat your question. Sorry, can you hear me better now? Yes. Oh, my apologies, it's very loud. I'm currently on honeymoon and it's very loud noises at the back. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's fine. Was, yeah. <laughs> yes. I was asking, how can you prove your case and appoint medical experts if the hospital conveniently lost or, mispla or misplaced the medical record or to the maternity register? How can you proceed with your case then? Okay, how, um, how can a court appoint um, um, experts? Is that your question? Let me just simply just select my ear fans and I can try it. Okay, um, Anari, I, I, I suggest type it quickly in your in your chat in the chat box. Then then I will be able to read it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I, I'll definitely come back to that. Um Lorenz, Lorenzo Kitsting. Kisting. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just yes. The colleagues um, point that he made with a strenuous time it takes to litigate these cases. You know, are, or are you aware of interim relief that has been sought uh, pending litigation with these cases, especially CP cases that's been dragging on, and the possible dangers with that? I mean, if, 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 if one seeks uh, interim relief for the treatment of spastic babies born with CP, uh, and allow this hospital to, 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 to provide care. Obviously, at the end of the day, they can argue that these defenses uh, actually work. They can provide the case, so why should they pay? You know, perhaps if interim relief can be sought for such cases, especially the ones dragging on for eight to 10 years? Yo, know, the CP cases are, are difficult. Um, and and um, hang on with your question. Um, I'm going to share my, my uh, PowerPoint with you because I want to specifically refer to, to CP cases in towards the end. So just hang on with your question. My, my presentation will not take very long, and then I, I'll come back if I did not answer it when, when I could quickly go through the PowerPoint. Um, Anari, yes, and please type the, the, the question, then I'll also address that. Okay, there's just my name again and my email address. If for some or other reason your question is not answered today or whatever, you've got other questions, you are welcome to email me. You can see my email address there, slabm at unisa.ac.za. So I quickly want to draw your attention to a, a, a interesting case. And the reason being that you can see there, it happened in March 2023. So it is extremely fresh. But why I'm why am I discussing this case with you? Because I want you as, as lawyers and when you get cases, I, I, I desperately want someone to, to run with the locality rule. And, and I think at the end, when I've discussed this case, you will see what I mean. So this is not cerebral palsy. Don't worry, I'll come to cerebral palsy. But I, I, want, you to, I want to discuss this case as I found it extremely interesting. And, and I think there's a lot to learn about it. Okay, so you can see it's Lowe versus Patel. So it is two individuals against each other. So it's not the MEC, so the state is not involved. So it happened in Standerton. So in the court case itself, it speaks of Standerton as a small town in Mpumalanga. Sorry, I'm just drinking water. And the reason why this case touches my heart so much is because we used to live in Stanerton. So I sort of know the community of Stanerton. And it happened at a public hospital. So there was Dr. Patel. Dr. Patel had a, um, um, consulting rooms at his home. So one evening at 15.30, at, uh, at 17.30, at half past five, there was a robbery 
and the doctor was shot in his lower leg. Coincidentally, Dr. Yusup was a colleague of him, also a medical doctor, also a general practitioner. He was his neighbor. So he heard about the shooting. He ran over to the neighbor. In the meantime, the the um, emergency workers have arrived and they started helping Dr. Patel. But Dr. Patel then asked Dr. Yusup to call Dr. Habs, who is a more senior um, general practitioner in the area of Staniton. But Dr. Habs was not on duty. So Dr. Lowe, took the call and he said to Dr. Yusup, he will definitely help Dr. Patel. He will go to the hospital. He just have to finish. Remember this. He has to finish his after hour patients. And he had an emergency appendectomy scheduled for half past six at that hospital. So that was his response. In the meantime, the the emergency services took Dr. Patel to the Standerton Public Hospital. And Dr. Lowe arrived at 1820. Not not very late after or long after Dr. Patel. So he looked at Dr. Patel and he ordered x-rays because he saw that the the bone in the lower leg was fractured. So he decided while they will take Dr. Patel for the x-rays, he will go and do the appendectomy. Reason being, a pre- he lost a previous patient when he did appendectomy and, and he didn't want to lose another one. And he could only get, remember all these things because they are all going to play into what the court said at the end. So he said he's going to perform the operation. He doesn't want to lose another patient because he will be able to do it while the x-rays are being taken. He could also only do it that evening because an anesthetist and the GP who will assist him, they were only available after hours. So it was a lot of things to organize these people to be there for the operation. So he didn't want to postpone. There was no one else that could do the operation on his behalf. And the anesthetist and the GP was only available after hours. So he did the operation while Dr. Patel went for x-rays. So at seven o'clock, he saw the x-rays and he then realized that the Standerton Public Hospital doesn't have a vascular specialist nor an orthopedic surgeon. So he he saw that the, the, um, um, the wound was so bad that Dr. Patel had to be moved. But believe it or not, that the Standerton Hospital did not have an ambulance. So he had to call a private hospital and quickly find out where he can get an ambulance. And he got an ambulance. The ambulance on their side tried to airlift, but there was no helicopter available. So the head of the ambulance service, who was a qualified ambulance man who had the necessary qualification certificates, etc. So he got into the ambulance and he said, OK, he will come, but they are in Secunda. Now, Secunda is about 60 kilometers from Standerton. And, you know, the condition of the roads these days. But OK. Before they will dispatch the ambulance, they need a delivery address. So remember, it's now still Dr. Lowe organizing all of this. So he remembered he had a friend at Pretoria East Hospital, Dr. Straub. So he called Dr. Straub. Dr. Straub said he's not on duty and he referred him to Dr. Tollach who was also an orthopedic surgeon, and he was on call. And Dr. Straub said that he will liaise with Dr. Tollach, and he will warn him that a patient is on its way from Standerton. In the meantime, 
the stand the ambulance arrived and you must now see that the clock is ticking the clock is ticking so the ambulance arrived at standerton dr patel was put in the ambulance and while they were driving to Pretoria, the ambulance men, the trained, well-qualified ambulance men saw that there was compartment syndrome. Now, that means that the tissue around the wound is starting to die and fall apart. Okay, so they arrived at Pretoria East Hospital. Dr. Toller, who was told the patient is on its way, wasn't there. But he told the emergency doctor that Dr. Patel is on its way and they must do an angiogram and then he will come. But when they arrived at Pretoria East, the emergency doctor called Dr. Tollach immediately and said, but they definitely need a vascular surgeon, a surgeon to work with the arteries. And they don't have one of those at Pretoria East. The ambulance man tried to explain to the emergency doctor that there's a problem. They, they need a better surgeon. Anyway, time was wasted. Dr. Tollach eventually arrived at Pretoria East. He called Dr. Buetis at the uh, Pretoria Heart Hospital. And Dr. Patel was moved there. But now the time, the time from the incident when the wound was sustained and the time when Dr. Buetis, the vascular specialist, tried to save the leg was too long and the leg was amputated. So Dr. Patel was not happy. So he sued. Dr. Patel, who lost his leg, he sued Dr. Lowe, Dr. Yusuf, and the MEC. He added the MEC because it was a public hospital, but later he dropped the claim against the MEC because Dr. Lowe and Yusuf was not state employees. They did not work for the public hospital. They only used the public hospital where they did operations, but they were not in the employment of the state. So Dr. Patel sued Dr. Lowe and Yusuf. But then, unfortunately, Dr. Yusuf passed away. So it is only Dr. Lowe left. So in the High Court, the claim was dis dismissed. The High Court said there's no causality between... Okay, the, the allegation was Dr. Lowe did not, with the necessary urgency, organized the moval, the transport of Dr. Patel. He should not have done the operation. He should have, during the time he did the operation, he should have called the ambulance and organized the transfer. In other words, the claim was for an omissio, for something that Dr. Lowe did not do. So the High Court dismissed the claim and said there is no causation between the fact that Dr. Lowe did not um, timelessly organize a transfer and the amputation. Dr. Patel was not satisfied and he appealed to the full court of the High Court. And then they upheld the appeal. So the full court then said there is causation between what Dr. Lowe did not do and the amputation. And then Dr. Lowe got permission to appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And the Supreme Court of Appeal, this, the appeal was dismissed. And Dr. Lowe was uh, found guilty of negligence in that he did not do. He did not respond fast enough. So I want you to read this case because it is extremely interesting, the detail. And I've given you briefly the facts, but I'm sure... A lot of you have questions in your mind. There were so many opportunities for things to go wrong. 
And now poor Dr. Lowe is the one that the court eventually say is responsible. The other reason why I want you to read the court is because there was a majority and a minority judgment. Three judges gave the majority judgment and two judges the minority judgment. And my sentiment goes more with the minority judgment. The other thing that I want you to see in this case are the use of the experts. What is very, very interesting in this case is how the court valued the experts. At the end, the majority accepted an expert who never saw Dr. Patel. He never saw the wound. He only based his opinion on the notes that Dr. Buitis wrote. But Dr. Buitis was the person who treated the, the wound. He was the expert. He saw the wound. He saw all the damage. Yet the majority of the court accepted um, the other doctor and as an expert and what that doctor said. So I, I want you to go and see because that is strange. That is extremely strange in medical law cases. Um, we all know the um, Linksfield Park case that say that an expert must be logic. The reasoning must be logic. But they still followed the expert who never saw the patient. In the court case, they also create a hypothetical scenario. If everything were perfect, would the leg be saved? Will they, would there have been enough time to save the leg um, um, instead of amputating it? Also very interesting. It's a hypothetical scenario in a perfect world. But knowing where Staniton is, knowing where Secunda is, knowing the road from Staniton to Pretoria, it is impossible to create a perfect hypothetical scenario. Okay, and then um, um, no causation or there's no co um, um, causal link. That was what the majority said. But the majority said there is a causal link. Now, why am I telling you all of this? First of all, because it's a very, very, very interesting case to read, to see how the judges argued, to see the majority versus the minority, to see how they um, valued the expert witnessing, to see the employment of a hypothetical scenario. And then there's one thing that I feel that should have been argued in that court case, and that is the locality rule. You remember that in the beginning when, when I discussed um, the introduction, etc., I spoke somewhere about the locality rule. In the judgment of um, Van Wyk versus Lewis, the locus classicus of medical negligence, the 1924 appellate division case. In that case, the judges differed. The one judge said there is something like a locality rule. In other words, the same rules cannot apply in Pretoria East Hospital than in Staniton. Because the locality, the resources differs. And I think in this case, it is quite clear that the hospital didn't even have an ambulance. They had to get an ambulance from Secunda. All these things should have been argued because the locality, according to me, had a huge influence on how the whole scenario played out. Yet it was not touched on, it was not argued in court. In that same case of Van Wyk versus Lewis, the other judge said, no, there is nothing like locality because the doctors get the same training and irrespective of where they practice, they, you can and you should expect the same expertise from them. 
So I'm just putting it out there to you. As I've said, let's quickly go back that it is a, a, a new case of 9 March 2023. So it's extremely fresh, if I can put it like that. I want you to read the case, especially if you are practicing medis medical law or medical negligence, etc. Read the case and you are welcome to disagree with me. But then Google the locality rule and you will come across an article by Professor Carstens, who is the guru of medical law. He has now retired, but he wrote in Dairebus a, a, a piece on the locality rule. And it is my feeling that the locality rule should get a place in an argument in medical negligence cases, especially in our country, where we have such a diverse medical scenario, where you have public hospitals and private hospitals and hospitals in the middle of Santon and hospitals in Limpopo. The, the locality rule must get some place and must be argued by some people handling a case. Okay, I leave it at that. You can hear that I'm very passionate about the locality rule, but we can talk about it just now. Then I want you to um, draw your attention also to a fairly new case. And it was, um, the judgment is from the Eastern Cape. There you get the information and yes, I will make the slides available. I will also, with the other slides, send this through to Bonnie and Grace, and so you will have it tomorrow. This is a very important case, and it was adjudicated on the 7th of February, so it is also very new. It's a public hospital and it's cerebral palsy and the claim was more than 35 million rand. But what is extremely interesting in this case, and you must please go to the trouble of getting this case because it's a new case. It's only the High Court, so it is not a Supreme Court, a court of Appeal, therefore it is not that binding. But what was interesting in that case is that the judgment, remember now, especially if you are working for the state attorney or you are working for a company who's contracted by the state attorney, meaning that you um, appear for the defense, it has become now a sort of um, um, common practice to, to argue that future medical costs will not be paid once and for all in a lump sum because of the DZ case. Remember the DZ case, the constitutional court case, where it was said that the common law could be developed concerning future medical costs so that those costs need not be paid in a lump sum but be paid in kind in services. And then there were cases where it was done, specifically the, the, um, the one that I refer you there, that Judge Keithley, um, the judgment she gave, where she inter sort of interviewed everyone in the public sector to see whether they would be able to provide to this child the same service or even better service than in a, um, a private hospital. Now, when that judgment was given in 2020, the feeling amongst us medical law um, 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 academics was that, yes, it's all very well, you can do it for one child, but it is impossible to do it for 150, 250, I don't know the numbers. So we had questions about that case. So the same now happened in the Eastern Cape. But the judge there, he, the judgment is a combination between the remedies. In other words, certain part of the future cost is paid in a lump sum, while other services must be provided 
by the public sector. And um, the judge determined there's a lot of annexures to that case. And you can you will be able to see how the judge argued because it is not a straightforward following of the development of the common law, but certain parts are. So this is a new case. A lot of people are talking about this case, so it will be worth your while to read the case. Also to see the number of experts in the case and how the judge or um, the, the court uh, dealt with the experts. In other, But in, in the bottom line, the judge said that the development of the common law must be on a case-by-case -case basis. You will find it sort of common cause nowadays that the, 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 the attorneys appearing for the defense, for the state, for the MEC, they will come with the argument of DZ and then say that they're not willing to pay future medical costs because it must be provided. But it doesn't work in every situation. So this is an example of a case where it was a combination between a, an amount plus that services will be provided. But you can see there that the claim was more than 35 million rand. And it just becomes important possible for the different provinces to, to pay out these huge amounts in, in a lump sum. So that is an important case to take cognizance of. Then here's another case. This is um, where a lady gave birth in a public hospital. It's, it's not about cerebral palsy, but the woman were cut during the birth process, we call that the episiotomy, and then there were damages. So it's a new case. It is good also to see how that case was handled. It is um, 16 March of 2023, so it's also very new. And it will be interesting for you to go and read that case to see how they applied the but for test. Then here is an, another one, and that is the last one, and then I'll go back to you and we can have a conversation. That you should take note of, of let, let me just see, yes, there's just another one. You should take note of this case. This is an even newer case, um, and it was in the Supreme Court of Appeal on the 18th of April this year. So it is very, very new. And in this case, the Supreme Court of Appeal specifically said that there's no need to develop the common law because the defendant did not argue or establish that it is worthwhile to develop the common law. Once again, it concerns the payment of one lump sum. So in this case, the defendant could not prove that the public hospital will be able to provide the services of the same or an acceptable high standard um, at the state hospital as this person will get in the private sector or with specialists of his or her own choice. So it, as I've said, it become a common practice to fall back on the DZ case and to argue that you, you from the defendant side, from the MEC side, not willing to pay the lump sum, but you will have to be able to prove that there is a need to develop the common law. The last one is not this uh, that recent. It is in um, 2020, in March 2020, Supreme Court of Appeal case. Why I, I want you to, to maybe, if you've got time to go and read that case, is specifically to see the experts. The, the one expert did not budge and said from the very beginning they were negligence and the other expert was more inclined to concede that this could have happened, that could have happened. And it's what is very interesting, and I want you to, 
to, to pay attention to when there's a minority and a majority judgment. And it is happening more often nowadays, especially in the Supreme Court of Appeal, that you have a minority and a majority, which just indicates the difficulty of medical law cases, especially when there are a lot of experts and the court doesn't know, the court doesn't have the medical background, and then you get these different judgments. And yes, you then decide for yourself where, where, where you would like to go. Okay, these are just a few of the recent cases that, that I came across, and I think it will be worth your while to, to read that. Okay. Let me go to the chat, and in the meantime, you can prepare questions if you want to. Anri, how can you prove your case and appoint medical experts if the hospital conveniently lost or misplaced the medical records, including the maternity register? That is a huge problem, but there are judgments where the judges specifically refer to the importance of records, especially in the public sector. Some of the, rec um, the records can just disappear. But there is one fundamental bottom line in medical law, and that is if it is not written down, it did not happen. If it is not written down, it did not happen. So if they cannot produce the hospital records, then assumptions need to be made. Then you have to look at the circumstances and then the court will draw its own conclusion, which is not always the ideal. And, and it is a real problem. Um, I once did training at an attorney's firm who specifically were contracted for the state attorney. In other words, they were the defendants. And they even have problems getting medical records, especially in the, in, the, in the public sector. So I don't have a perfect answer for you because if the records are, are not there and they're gone, then it is extremely difficult, especially to, to appoint experts as you ask. What then usually happen is that the, the expert must look at all the circumstances surrounding this case, listen to the person that were affected, the mother of the child, if it is a cerebral palsy case or if it's a, 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 a patient that has been harmed him or herself, to listen to their story and then try to, to, to um, create a scenario of what could possibly have happened. But it is difficult. It is it is difficult, and yes, you're quite right. The hospitals conveniently lose some of the records, but the bottom line is, if it's not written down, it did not happen. In other words, the nursing staff or even the doctor, they can't come and say, yes, but I did it. Okay, where's the record? Now, I don't have the record anymore. Then it did not happen. So, it is difficult. I agree with you. I don't have an answer where to get it, how to get it, if it's lost, it's lost. Sometimes you will also see that the records have been changed. That um, once something has happened, then afterwards someone quickly goes and changes the records. But that could easily be seen. You can see it in the context, different handwriting, different color pen, etc. But I don't have a perfect answer for you. It, it, it is a huge problem. We dealt with the case during activity two of portfolio one. Yes. So that is a very, very, very important case. As I, as I say that the defense, the persons appearing for the MEC, they will sort of um, um, just by way of responding to the documents, say they're not willing to pay the future medical cost. They, those are in dispute because of the DZ case. They are willing to provide the, the, the services. But as I've said or highlighted to you in that um, case that we've just spoken about, you will still have to prove that the public sector are able to provide the services 
on the same or a better standard than in a private sector. OK, and now you can I've dealt with the chat. If you want to put in chats, put in chat. If you want to put up your hand, you are welcome. I've, <laughs> I've spoken fast and a lot, but I will make the the slides available. Anyone, there's no stupid question. If you just want to differ from me or criticize or say that we should do something different in this module, you're welcome. It's you in a safe place. You can ask me anything or say anything to me. Yes, Andrew. Yes, uh, Professor, just uh, thinking back on that, uh, the Lowe v. Patel case, um, is it correct to assume that they didn't apprehend the shooter? Because I would assume that that would be the first port of call for claiming damages, the person who actually caused the damage initially. Okay, remember re remember that um, a robbery is a criminal case. So, yes, of course, a criminal case will be opened, but then um, if... But Patel wanted, and he knows the person. He could possibly institute a, 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 a civil claim to um, against that person. But usually, the um, usually it's not worth it. Attorneys won't take it because the robber will probably not have money to um, uh, to pay. That that is the sad part. You you have that right to institute a civil claim against the person who has hurt you. But in, in, in criminal cases, it is just not worth the while. The legal cost will be more than than what you will get from the robber. And um, the civil uh, the criminal case will take it it scores and and if he is apprehended and found guilty, of course he will go to jail. But for um, I don't I, I honestly don't think it's 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 worthwhile um, instituting an action against a, a civil action um, against someone like that. And the other argument is that um, yes, he shot him, but that is the whole argument of the low case. If he had better medical uh, uh, treatment. In other words, let's say, for example, in a perfect world at the Standard and Hospital, there was an orthopedic surgeon and there was a vascular surgeon. Then the leg could have been saved. And, and then he would not have suffered damage. But his whole argument is, because of the time lapse, too, too, too much time. Um, the clock was ticking too fast, and and then compartment syndrome um, steps in, and the leg could not be saved. But that is the whole thing that I want you to see. Was it possible in a perfect scenario or not? And and the majority said yes. In a in in a scenario, if everything, for example. If Dr. Lowe did not do the operation and he organized an ambulance immediately, plus if he spoke to Dr. Tollich himself, not through Dr. Straub, and they talked about this whole issue, then he would probably, Dr. Tollich would probably have realized that not only an orthopedic surgeon is necessary, but a vascular surgeon. And he would have recommended them to take uh, Dr. Patel to Union Hospital or Mill Park, which is closer to Stanerton. But there was a communication gap. Dr. Tollich said he was never told that um, a, a vascular surgeon was necessary, which raises question. You're an orthopedic surgeon, you are notified of um, um, a gun wound in the lower leg. The femur uh, bone was broken and it, it, it was by a bullet. Shouldn't you, in your experience, have known that it's not only an orthopedic surgeon necessary? So, you see, these are the, the kinds of questions that pops up into my mind. You, and, and you are welcome to differ. But my feeling is um, 
first of all, that Dr. Tollach should have questioned, why do they only want the orthopedic surgeon if it was a gun wound? The second question is, why wasn't he at Pretoria East Hospital when Dr. Patel arrived? The next question is that Dr. The emergency doctor that was notified, that waited for Dr. Patel, paid no attention to the ambulance man who could have told him there is bigger problems. So let's not um, take this patient out of the ambulance. Let's rather find another hospital with a vascular surgeon. But they paid no attention. They did not listen to him. So there's a lot of questions which comes to my mind. Is Dr. Lowe the only one that that was negligent or was there a whole chain of of negligence and that's why i i would love you to read it and you can engage with me and you can say you don't agree with me or, or what but i just feel that dr low was in a predicament he saw the person he realized he needed to be moved because of the locality everything wasn't possible to do it as fast as it should have happened. But I personally feel he tried his best. You must now remember that he is now found guilty of negligence, which could have an effect on his practice and the quantum have or the damages have not yet been claimed. But I honestly just feel I, if I was the, the legal advisor for Dr. Lowe, I, I, I would have tried at least and argued the locality rule. Um, he, he, he can't be guilty of, of negligence because of all the circumstances he, he was in. But uh, I, I just find it interesting. Yes, Andrew. So in, in that scenario, if you, know, if, if you could go back in time, what mm -hmm. were Dr. Lowe's alternative options? He, you know, he could have delayed the, the surgery of the appendectomy, but likewise, if there'd been complications because of that delay, that patient could have sued him for, you know, delaying Correct. a planned procedure. Or would he have Correct. had the option of denying and of being able to say, I don't want to be involved, I don't have the expertise, and absolve himself that way? Or does his medical obligation uh, prohibit see, him from stepping back? the problem is, and... That is why I, I come back to the locality rule again. There were no other options. Dr. Yusuf, the, the one that passed away, he was just a general practitioner. He has never transferred a patient. So he couldn't even ask him to organize the transfer while he does. There was just no one else. Dr. Habs, which they originally wanted, he was not in, on call. So Dr. Lowe was left alone. There was no other doctor who he could ask to do the operation. There was no other one who he could ask to organize the transfer with the complication that there's no ambulance. So he had to find out where to get an ambulance. And that is why I say there are so many factors in, in this scenario that I honestly do not feel that Dr. Lowe can stand alone as the negligence party and be responsible for the damages suffered. But this is an interesting case and, and, and one can learn a lot from it. As I've said, my, my feeling goes with the minority judgment. What is interesting is Dr. Um, Dr. Boffard, who was the expert for Dr. Patel, who the majority then at the end accepted. He even made comments about the caliber of the gun. Now, can a doctor do that? He said, according to the x-rays that he saw, remember, he never saw Dr. Patel. He never saw the wound. But based on the x-rays and on the reports that Dr. Boetis wrote, who saw the patient, Dr. Boffard said, yeah, but it, it was a certain caliber um, 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 weapon or bullet or whatever. And and the, the court accepted that. And that, according to me, is outside his field of expertise. It should have been questioned. But apart from that, they, they should have valued the doctor who 
actually saw the wound. And that is why I come back to Dr. Toller, who is an orthopedic surgeon. If you as an orthopedic surgeon with many years of experience hear that there's um, a, 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 a femur broken because of a gunshot, shouldn't it come to your mind that it is not a clean break. For example, let's say I'm a gymnast and I fall from one of the apparatus and on my leg. It's it's a clean break. But with a gunshot, it is never clean. So my feeling is he should have questioned, why are you moving this patient to me? I'm just an orthopedic surgeon. I'm sure with a gun wound, the arteries have been damaged. So Let's rather um, organize it to another hospital. But none of that happened. And and then at the at the end, the, the court found Dr. Lowe himself. And, and it raises just a, lo a lot of questions with me. OK, uh, Lorenzo, you want to ask something? Coming from both a medical and legal background, um, it's quite difficult just to jump to a conclusion as easily as that. Um, we agree with the, with the expert uh, was supposed to be placed in a similar situation, similar challenges and facts, in order to, 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 to guide the court in making its decision and not to decide for the court itself. Whilst I can also see that one should recognize that compartment syndrome is. Um, the excessive swelling of tissue to extent where it cuts off blood supply. And usually this cannot be expected to, to develop rapidly. This usually is a process that takes anywhere between four to six hours. And uh, to expect that doctor to have recognized that compartment syndrome already happened whilst under his care, it's not reasonable. That's why it was discovered um, only by the ambulance uh, personnel uh, that uh, saw the compartment syndrome that happened. Secondly, um, whilst uh, not defending the doctor that, that uh, Dr. Lowe is, uh, my primary question would be why didn't he primarily do a vascular assessment? Because if he was the primary doctor or primary port of departure for this patient, he would have performed a vascular assessment other than just the orthopedic injury that this patient sustained. OK, please read the case because I might have missed certain points and you're quite correct. He did. He did. He, he um, um, when he, he looked at, at the injury and when he proposed or said that he must go for, um, for x-rays, he did realize that he will need a, a, a vascular specialist. He did that and that is why he wanted to move him as soon as possible. Okay, there are arguments in the court case that said, why did he even waste time with x-rays? He should have, as you've indicated, saw compartment syndrome or saw that the arteries were so badly damaged. He shouldn't even have asked for x-rays. He should have moved him immediately to a hospital where these specialist services. That is one of the arguments. He didn't do that. But he says that in his note and in his communication with Dr. Straub, he told him that um, the compartment syndrome is a possibility and that arteries were injured or whatever. But he, uh, Dr. Lowe, did not speak to Dr. Tollach. Dr. Straub spoke to Dr. Tollach. And in that communication, there was a communication gap that Dr. Tollach testified and he said that he was never made aware that a vascular surgeon would be necessary. And that's why the question in my mind is, couldn't he think it would be necessary? But never mind, he wasn't told. He wasn't told. So there was a communication breakdown between the doctor um, um, dispatching the patient and the doctor receiving the patient. And that was one of, of the, the um, 
the grounds on which Dr. Lowe was found guilty is that the communication was not well enough. He did not specify that um, a vascular surgeon is necessary, although he said he did tell Dr. Straub, Dr. Straub did not tell Dr. Um, Dr. Tollach. So that was one, and that is why I say this case is so interesting because it is based on what did not happen, an omissio. Remember, in, in our legal system, we have a commissio, that is where the doctor perforates an artery and the person uh, bleeds to death. That is a commissio, he did something wrong, he was negligent. This whole case centers around an omissio, what he did not do, and he was found guilty of that. Is it fine, Lorenzo? You want to, to make more comments? As just a reasonable foreseeability on all of their parts. It's like expecting this patient not to develop um, a sepsis uh, infection from that. You have a reasonable foreseeability on all of their parts. Yes, you see that that is why I honestly want you to, to read the case because there's more to it than just saying Dr. Lowe was negligent because he didn't organize the transport faster. It, 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 to me, the case is not that simple, but that was the case in the Supreme Court of Appeal and he was found guilty of negligence and he must now pay the damages. So um, uh, medical and, and, and that brings us to, to um, a, a few other things where you may, be, you may engage with me is, do we need special courts? Do we need special judges who can um, um, adjudicate medical negligence cases. Because what is also interesting is they, the test that they apply in that case for medical negligence, they did not go back to the locus classicus uh, that we quote continuously. They used a different case. The other thing is Shouldn't we change the whole system that instead of having experts for the plaintiff and the defendant, maybe have assessors to, to sit with the judge, to explain to the judge the, the medical facts instead of having one expert um, for or one or more. In, in this case, um, for the low case, it was one expert for Patel and there were two for, for low. But shouldn't the assessor be there to assist the judge so that you don't have the scenario where the majority went with Dr. Boffart? And, and it is strange. It is in, in all the years that I've read or studied medical negligence cases, this is the first one where, they, where I saw that they accepted the expert who has never seen the, the the patient who only worked from the notes and he he, he could he, he could do more but he did it where and they favored him above the doctor okay now what is also interesting if you read the case it seems to me that um, um, dr Buertis, the vascular surgeon is not a very um, outgoing um, extrovert person. So he stuck to his point. He was very in detail, pedantic. He never conceded and he quoted literature that said that um, you cannot have a fixed time in which you can say you could have saved the body part. All depend on the circumstances. So you cannot say the leg could have been saved within four hours. No one can say that because there's circumstances. And he was not willing to concede that there is a specific time limit in which the leg could have been saved. But I get the feeling that he did not make an impression as a person on the judges. And, and, and that happens. Um, um, some doctors are just not good witnesses, though they are extremely clever and they know their field, but they they just do not present well in court. Yes, Lorenzo. Well, reasonable bias can be against the expert. It can never be removed from human nature. 
whether it's for the defense or whether it's for the plaintiff, the reasonable bias must always be anticipated and expected. And the, uh, what you said about the assessor guiding the court in its decision making makes perfect sense because, as I said, um, bias will always be there. Yes. One cannot argue that away. Yes, and, and, and hired guns, unfortunately. I mean, no one is perfect. We we would like all people to be very ethical, but you get hired guns as, as well that, that specifically come and say what what the plaintiff want them to say. So it, it, it is a difficult. So I, I want you to see these things because I think in the very first um, recording that I made, I said, if you think medical law is a short way to become very rich, then you're missing the point because it is not. There, there are so many intricacies in medical law cases, apart from the time that it takes, the experts, the the, um, the judges, how, how do they interpret? The, the other case is what is it? It's a Western Cape case of the rugby player. I can't remember now. But they also the experts. Um, I I didn't agree with with the experts that the court followed. I can't remember the court case now. But you you should know. Um, anyway, it is you just don't know why. Judges sometimes favor the one above the other. In in that case that I'm talking about now, about the rugby player, um, I found the one expert. And remember, I only have the the record. I only read the judgments. I, I found that expert extremely arrogant. And, and the court favored him. That is why we ask you the activities not questions from your study material, because we want you to read as many cases as possible. At some stage, I try to print each and every cerebral palsy case, but it, it just became too many. But I've got a stack here next, next to me. And well, you should keep on reading the cases, reading the cases, reading the cases, because that is where you learn. You can study the theory. I mean, all of you by now know the test for medical negligence. You know this, you know that. But to read the cases, that is that is where you get clues or see different ways of approaching cases, um, etc. Yes, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, you yes, can talk. Just back, to my question, uh, just back to the question that I uh, asked in the beginning. So my question was centered around uh, interim relief pending litigation or whatnot, um, for especially for those cases that one can reasonably expect to be dragging on in the court for up to six to eight years. Um, it's quite heartbreaking to think that a baby with CP, with spastic baby, and most of these cases are brought by by the poorer poorest of us in the community. That um, what well, what's a way for? Do you know of where interim relief was granted in some degree to 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 alleviate the pain and suffering of these people whilst the, the case is still ongoing or not? Well, no, I, I I don't specifically know, but but how are we going to change this? It's the lawyers that need to change. It's, it's it's the 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 big law firms, and I say this with respect. I mean, I've got a hell of a respect for for good lawyers, and I've got respect for good doctors, etc. But thirty five million on contingency is a lot of money. Um, let's say you you stick to the twenty five percent that you what is twenty five percent of thirty five million. It, it's it's a lot of money, so there's a lot at stake. Um, but, but my feeling is, yes, the, the child has been damaged and, and that is sad and the child needs to be looked or taken care of. But sometimes it goes beyond understanding. Um, you even you get dentist, orthodontist to, to, to give amounts what it will cost for the child's teeth. You get architects what it will cost to change the house. And as you said, these are the poorest of the poor, and you must please hear my heart that I'm not saying you must leave that child, but you give that child 
basic care. Give that child a carer or carers to look after the child, nappies, um, good nutrition, all of that. But going to the extent of building a house, a, a, a new house, they're living in a shack. Now the architect quotes what it will cost to build a house which is accessible to wheel um, wheelchairs. And the, the child must get this therapy and that therapy and that therapy. And sometimes I just feel it, it, it goes beyond what is really necessary. What what the child really really needs, and and remember that all these experts, the amount gets inflated, inflated, inflated. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, remember that the budget, the uh, Department of Health, they give a budget to the nine provinces, and from that budget, everything must be done. Everything must be done. So the the provincial hospitals are running into bankruptcy because of medical negligence claims. If they have to pay out, let's say, 16 cases of 35 million, can you imagine what they could have done with that money? Now, that's another debate. Should these claims be kept? I, I don't know. I, they, at this moment in, in, in time, there's no perfect solution. You get some people campaigning for capping. You get other people campaigning for special courts. You get a lot of people campaigning for mediation. So there's a lot of of um, possibilities on the table. But it must be someone must buy into it and run with it and change the system. And uh, the lawyers um, my personal opinion are stubborn because in con on contingency, they make a lot of money. Andrew? Yes, I was going to cover um, some of what you've just mentioned. That I've, I'm in that school of thought that capping fees is probably a good thing in that it, it restricts the excessive amounts that, that are claimed in some of these cases. Um, but also, what are the options for for state practitioners to rather be insured by independent insurers so that it's not the state that has to foot the bill it's in the same way that a private doctor has professional indemnity a state doctor should have the same external insurer so it doesn't become a, a taxpayer burden it's rather a yes. private insurer's issue yes excellent suggestion the problem is just now that the um, well, that is that what I've read, what I've heard. I don't say that as a fact, but then the state have to pay the the um, um, insurance cost because they say they are employees. They are not definitely not going to pay it from their own pocket. So the state need to pay it. So yes, that is one way of looking of um, to it, and that is a possible solution. What bothers me more at this stage is what happened to those people the 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 the, um, the nursing staff and the doctors that are um, guilty of negligence remember they are not sued in person it's their employer because of vicarious liability so it's the mec for the province but what happens after that? Let's say um, um, the merits are now approved, the MEC is 100% liable. What happens to those doctors, to those, nurse, to those nurses? Are they ever disciplined? Um, will they notify the HPCSA or the nursing council? It, it feels to me there's a lack of responsibility. So it is, it is easy to mess up because I'm working for the state. So my employee takes responsibility for me, but I just feel there's something lacking. But you will find that the, the same nurses and the same gynecologist who's responsible for a cerebral palsy case, they just come to work the following day and, and they carry on. There's, there's no system in place or mechanism in place to, to call these people who are involved to, to justice. And maybe, and now I'm just throwing a stone between you, you can agree with me or not, maybe the route should be taken that was taken with Dr. Van der Walt, that the people be criminally charged. I do not know of nurses 
that has ever been criminally charged. Okay, if you go the the criminal route, then you will not get financial um, compensation, but you will get the satisfaction that if the person is then found guilty criminally, then at least, like Dr. Van der Waal, spent some time in prison. Sorry for, for the lightning. We've got load shedding. I've, I've got a UPS, so the it, it's going on but the light. Right. Okay, um, um, so Andrew, do you want to follow up or say yes, something? Uh, the, the reason for suggesting the, the private insurance is to address that last point you made, is that if a, a private insurer has to cover the liability for negligent doctors or nurses, if the same person is committing multiple offenses, it's the same as a, a driver of a car with insurance making continual crashes, eventually the insurer will want to drop them as a client. And if you have laws in place saying you cannot practice without insurance coverage, then that way you remove those practitioners from the industry. Yes, that 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 can be a very good solution. Yes, it's just it just depends whether there's a political will to 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 make it work. Um, Sikandar Kola, you, yes, you, your I, hand is up. Yes, yes, just um, in response to Andrew, um, and I think Prof covered it uh, uh, briefly. Um, uh, the the principle of, of, of vicarious liability, um, the fact that the state has deeper pockets, um, one would institute action against the employer rather than um, instituting action against, you know, an individual. Um, uh, it, it would be, uh, how can I say, it would yes. be uh, in, it would be in, <laughs> Um, it would be in the interest of of the party instituting the the the, the litigation to rather uh, institute it against the employer than it would uh, you know the 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 the, the medical professional. So the, uh, yes, I just want to add it, add that. Yes, yes, but but it is it is a problem of of accountability also. Yes. That's a, that's a deep else? question, there, Prof. Yeah, sorry, I just want yes, to, that's a yes. deep question, you know, because, uh, like, you know, if we, if the employer, which is the state, would actually, you know, uh, really be serious in um, disciplining these, you know, these, these uh, medical professionals, then, you know, it would, it would probably sort out the system. Chances are many of these matters yes. that arise, uh, you know, um, are common to certain, you know, persons, and uh, it's 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 a sad state of affairs that you know they're not taking it um, uh, to the yes. next level, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, one of the first things that the state can possibly do is, if, if they don't want to get involved, is just um, re refer it to the HPCSA. But remember, the state doctors and private doctors have to be registered. But the, um, the HPCSA should be notified, and, and from their side, um, the person then should be disciplined. If, if the, the MEC, uh, him or herself, doesn't want to do it. But these names doesn't even go to the HPCSA, which, yeah, uh, yeah, which is a problem it, in, in itself. Is mm, it, it? It is a problem. It is a it is a problem. So yes, as I said, they they need they everybody is looking for a solution, but no one's taking the responsibility of coming forward and driving um, a solution. And in, in, in the end, the people are suffering. That they are really suffering of bad, bad service, which should not happen. Anyone else? Okay, so I'm gonna ask, Justin, did you enjoy the course? Did you learn anything from it? Did you benefit from it? Uh, Justin, hi, yes. yes, yes, um, yes. So actually, I did enjoy the course. Um, I wanted to do the course. I believe last year or the year before. I can't remember exactly, 
but for some reason it wasn't presented. So I'm not sure if it was last year or the year before, or if the place I was looking at just didn't have it accurately. Mm. Um, but yes, I did enjoy it. I unfortunately I'm not practicing or doing medical law, um, but I did have it as one of my rotations when I was doing my articles, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had it as a module at varsity. I actually got taught by um, Prof. Carstens at Tux Excellent. and subsequently did my um, dissertation in medical uh, law as well. So yes, I did enjoy it. Um, I will say I felt that the first three activities were a bit harder than the last three, so that was nice ending up on a a uh, bit of an easier um, <laughs> with a bit of a, with a bit easier questions. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've yet to do the test, so I'm not too sure about that one. Um, but yes, yeah, I did enjoy the course and I did learn a lot. Okay, thank you, and sorry for picking on them. I I just see names here in front of me, so I'm just not a problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just asking, um, Tabinisha Stierman. You've got it, something to say? Good evening, Prof. Yes. Um, not at the moment. It was very interesting. The course itself, um, the learning outcomes, everything was very, very interesting. Um, like Justin also said, um, I was also doing my articles way back. Um, I'm a non-practicing attorney at the moment and I'm looking into the field um, for when I will be practicing again. I really enjoyed it while I did my articles. Um, it's very, 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 very interesting. Okay, thank you. Just a, a thought, those of you not practicing or those still studying or those with time, Maybe consider doing the uh, mediation course. As I said, I did it through um, University of Stellenbosch, um, Conflict Dynamics. It, 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 is, it is quite challenging. It, it, it was, it, it's really, really challenging. But I think, especially in, in medical negligence cases, that you who did the course or who did it at, at, um, at, at varsity, either at, at UNISA or Tux or wherever, you've got an advantage. So I think it, it is indispensable um, in medical negligence cases for the mediator to at least know the test for, for medical negligence or to know what you have been taught this. So it is something to think about. It's quite an expensive um, um, course and it's, it's quite time consuming. But if, if we are going to drive mediation and if the court are going to, to um, insist that the people must try alternative dispute resolution and, and um, it goes that way, then it can be to your advantage if, if you are an uh, um, accredited mediator. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. It's difficult, but it's interesting. Yes, Andrew. Uh, yes, Professor, I actually did the lead uh, civil mediation course last year, and it, it was a, it's a two-week course, uh, very intensive, but you get a lot of practical yes. opportunity to, to test your skills and be challenged by the various scenarios. So you, you typically work through theory for the first week, and then the second week, it's, it's all practical where you, yes. you literally have to be party to mediation, either as the mediator or as, uh, as players for either side in, you know, in dispute. Yes. And it, it really does give you a very valuable opportunity to, to stretch your legs and actually, you know, uh, see that you can do it yourself. Uh, so yes. I, I would definitely recommend um, that folk do it. I mean, I'm at this stage still looking for an article position. So I'm doing as many of these courses as I can at the time to sort of beef up my mm. my skills practically um but it's it's something i really enjoyed um this this course as well had a lot of um very practical elements just in how the process works and in in understanding a lot of the the law if you like behind the, the yes, various types yes. of claims and i i found that very thought provoking as to the the real challenges that that we face in this country around this this issue uh, and it, it's it's to me, it's, it's an exciting part of law yeah. to be involved in. 
It is. It is extremely exciting. And the reason being people ask, but why did you choose medical law? Because it covers constitutional law, the law of delict, maybe some criminal law, civil procedure, the law of evidence, a little bit of labor law. It, it draws all of those sort of together. And then there is a huge component, ethics and a lot of emotion. And and what, what I found, I um, I only practiced as an advocate for a, for a year. I didn't like it. I realized I was more a teacher. But the bottom line of medical law, and I, I'm not saying this, this is certainly in, in the public sector and cerebral palsy cases, but in, in, in um, private practice where things go wrong, all that the client wants is to sit um, over a table with the doctor, look the doctor in the eye and ask what went wrong. Why did you do it? Why did it happen? Why did it happen to my child? Why did it happen to my wife? They want answers. And because of the insurance, the doctors do not speak. So they, there's a communication gap between the, the family of the person that has been hurt or the person itself and the medical team. And the, some attorneys feel that if the medical team will say, I'm sorry, we tried our best, that that is admittance of guilt. I don't think so. I think it's humanity. If you, let's say, for example, my ch child goes in for a minor operation and, and comes back and they septicemia and he ends up in ICU for six months, all I would like is answers. Explain to me. I think that the, um, the average person understands that medicine is not exact and, and a person can react differently to anesthetics or they, they can be septicemia in the hospital, which is not the responsibility of the doctor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that lack of communication, and that is where I feel there's a space for mediation, so that the the people who have been hurt can sit with the medical people and and talk about it. What what happened? Why did it happen? Why didn't you follow up? Ex all of that, and I think the the outcome will be more satisfying because now you sue, you, you go for the option of litigation. It is done by the lawyers, the legal teams, and you as patient, you never get the opportunity to look the doctor in the eye and say, why did you do that to me or to get closure? So, Yes, that is what makes it so interesting. I'm not saying that it will work in every scenario, but I found when I did the training of the mediator that that is an opportunity for people to speak their heart. I'll be with you just now, Lorenzo. I see Anari wrote, for those seeking article positions in the Northwest, you can send my CV to me. Okay, you you see that? If you're looking for articles, you can send your CV to Anneri, Anneri Grobler. Um, I hope, well, I'm making a re recording of this, but if you can quickly go to the chat box and get her email address, then that could help. Lorenzo, you wanted to say something? I will come from, as I said previously, from the medical branch. But what you can do is just to have a look on YouTube for the Elaine Bromley case. It's a UK case that uh, dealt with medical negligence and how they approached that and what her husband ultimately seeked as relief for it. It's quite a brilliant yes. uh, uh, thing to look at. Elaine Bromley. Uh, sorry, I can't type at the moment. So uh, Elaine Bromley is the case's name, and an inquiry was launched by the court into what transpired there. And the nice thing is they take you through all aspects of the case, what happened and the doctors and the nurses reactions. And at the end of the day, it, it takes you through the human nature and human aspect of it as well. Excellent. What is it? Elaine Bromley. That's correct. Elaine Bromley. Okay. I'll search, I'll, uh, I'll search for it and, and, and then I'll... I'll, I'll I'll write it down when they distribute the um the slides. Um, 
It's a short slide on it. OK, OK. Um, Andrew, you've got your hand up again. Yes, sorry, just a general question mm. um, on the, you or maybe some of the others may know. What is the scenario if, uh, thinking back to locality, if you've got a, a rural clinic where you don't have a specialist on standby and somebody comes in with an emergency scenario that they are not equipped to deal with, but they give the patient the option to say, we will attempt to heal you or to assist you, but know that it goes beyond our capabilities. Do you give consent for us to go ahead? If the patient does so, is the doctor then open for liability if things go wrong? Or does the consent cover them in that scenario? Um, there's no clear answer. It will cover them to some extent. Um, of the counter argument could be that the doctor should know his or her limitations. So it, it will depend very much on other circumstances as well. Okay, if it's a rural area and there will be no time to move the person and that something exceptional must be done um, and this person is not qualified for it, but do it with the consent of the patient, I will see. Uh, I will argue that 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 will be enough that the patient consented. Um, but I don't think it is. It is. It is that easy. It will depend on a, a lot of circumstances. It will, of course, differ because I know in a in in um, a lot of small towns like um, Secunda or Staniton, GPs do breast enlargement. So that's a different story. They, they, they act as plastic surgeons, which they should not do, but that is not an emergency. So the scenario that you created, you must remember, is emergency, and then also the Constitution comes in. Everyone has the right to emergency medical care. So I'm careful to to tell you that the consent will be enough. It will definitely depend on the scenario, the severity of the scenario, and the expertise required of of that person. But if I was in that doctor's shoes, I will try to at least save the life of the patient, and then afterwards argue that I tried my best and therefore I should be evaluated what the other reasonable doctor in the same circumstances would have done. But I'm 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 just saying this, I'm careful. In 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 medical law there's there's very seldom a yes or no or a black or white answer. It it depends on so so many things. Okay, anyone else? Who wants to do that? You've got my email address. You're welcome to speak to me. Jock, I will ask Bonnie why that, um, that happened and, and maybe just ask her to, to give some comments. But yeah, then I think this is all for today. Thank you for doing this course and I hope you enjoyed it. And as I've said, be proud of yourself. We we are expecting a lot of you and very interesting. The, the first three, uh, three questions was Bonnie's questions and the later questions is more my questions. But, but we, we do a little bit of each so that you get exposed to to different activities otherwise it can become boring okay so yes it's been a pleasure talking to you sorry for the light that went on and off but we've got load shedding now and thank you and good luck with all your careers and be ethical yes and maybe we will meet each other somewhere again so good night to all of you Thank Bye -bye. you, bro. Thanks, bro. Cheers. Thank you, bro. Cheers.